Many of you might be here, and this is this, this church thing, right? You've, you've come to church on, on Resurrection Sunday. So you already know there's a predictability to the message. Yes? You might want to nod your heads. There's a predictability. If there's one Sunday a year you know what the pastor is going to talk about, you hit it, right? If there's two, it's Christmas and Easter. And, and, and you already know. And here's what's, ha- here's what's happening right now. For some of you who are listening, you're already, because this is predictable, you're already ready to experience something called Mego. Has anybody ever heard of Mego before? It's called My Eyes Glaze Over. <laughs> For those of you online, this should not be happening already. Put your phone down or whatever you got to do. Push pause. Do something. But there, there's, there's a feeling of predictability, and as soon as things feel predictable, we feel tired, and we feel complacent, and we feel a little bit different. There's a predictability. Now, here's the thing, though. Kind, kind of duh. I mean, this is the day that this thing happened in history. So to not talk about it seems a little skeptical, right? And, and what you've done, and you've attended this gathering before, perhaps, and if this is your first time, you must be wondering, what on earth is this guy doing? And, you know, I don't know. That's not mine to figure out. We'll, we'll answer that later. But in the meantime, I want you to recognize there is a predictability to this message, but there's a reason for that. Because this day happened... It's, it's recorded in history, and you've heard the messages that, that lead to discussion about the stuff that's written about this outside of the Bible, and you've also heard people preach about what's recorded inside the Bible. All of this is actually intentional. It's intended to help you and myself to sort of re-believe and maybe remember better this message and what we've, what we've been given because of it. There is actually only one resurrection of Jesus after all. So it would make sense that we would bring it up. It would make sense that we would deal with it in a, in a sense today. But my prayer is every day. And so there's two primary things I want to show you today. There's two, two, two things, two camps of conversation I want to invite you to, to consider with me today. And the first is, is, yeah, what you're already familiar with. Did it happen? Did it happen? And then the second idea, not so far removed from it, is... So what? You didn't expect that to come up on a slide for a preaching message on Easter. So so what? Our pastor said, so what? Well, with a question mark. There's a question mark. And I want us to address these two things today. The predictability of Easter sermons and and, and Resurrection Sunday messages, that predictability, that's what causes your eyes to glaze over. And and I think this next sentence I'm going to say to you is kind of hopefully helpful to this. As soon as it starts to feel familiar to you, you're fearful that it's not going to do any more for you than it's done in the past. And you're still looking for other things to do something for you. Yes? You're still looking, maybe it wasn't enough. Maybe your understanding of what this day is about, just it didn't, it didn't kind of care. And so as soon as you start to hear the old narrative, start reading the old text, you start going to the old, I've already heard this, I already know this, it hasn't done any more for me, so I wonder what the score was from the game last night. I wonder what this and so on, and maybe I can nod off a little bit in the back and so on. But if we, would, if we would do something together today, I want each of you to just give me a few minutes. I want you to think with me in this moment. But I want you to do something that maybe isn't as easy for you as you think. I want you to think honestly. Really honestly. For some of you, how much you don't really want to be here today. And just deal with that. Just be honest about it. Maybe don't tell the person next to you and grieve them from it, but... At least bring it up in front of you if you don't want to be here or if you don't want to sit through this conversation or if you aren't sure it's really going to do anything or if you're fearful. Just whatever it is you are experiencing, bring it up in front of you in your mind and look at it and at least deal with it honestly for a second. Will you do that with me? Because if all of us can just see what we really are dealing with and what we're engaging, then then maybe this is the last time we have to have it happen that way. Maybe today what we deep down really actually wish most would come to us, will. That's what we've been praying all week. So if you're able to be honest with yourself and with this moment, then I think it's, it's more possible today that you could say to yourself that you're not so much concerned with whether or not this really happened. As I talk with many of you, and even people outside of this church family, 
I'm finding this proves true pretty often. That, that some of you are probably less concerned with whether or not this really happened, and you're, you're maybe more questioning whether it matters. Many of you have attended a predictable church service before, and they've talked through the history of the resurrection, and you've gone yes and amen, and even your hands have gone in the air, but you leave, and you leave somewhat disenfranchised, or maybe you've left somewhat just back to normal. And I think perhaps in part it's because you haven't maybe dealt with this second part as much. You've come to terms with it happened, but not whether or not it really matters to you. Does it, does it really matter? Does it really matter today? We, yeah, we can read that it mattered back then. Sure, got that. See it, yes. But does it matter right now when I get out of this room today? There's a sense in which some of you are so anxious and nervous in your daily life. And, and can we just lay this out for a minute? We all do have a lot going on. Anybody with access to any form of news knows there's a lot going on right now. There's these macro concerns that we have. Macro concerns like the environment, our government, the, na- the direction of our nation, the entertainment world. And these, these macro concerns, they're all over the place. But the longer you look at those macro concerns, you'll also notice that it our natural tendency is to see them become micro-concerns real fast. Those micro-concerns are when we look at those macro things like the environment and the government and the nation or the world and entertainment, and then we start to think about our kids and our grandkids. And all of a sudden, that which is macro and distant became very near and dear to us. And some of you have not yet tasted that, but you will. And others of you are still grieving the fact that you've tasted it too much. And you are still unsure of what to do. And so this whole so what thing, this whole what does the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we're preaching about it, it's Sunday, we're here, we're doing the thing, but tell me, Drew, does it matter today? Can it do something for me today? You might even just say to yourself, is coming to church to hear this message really going to affect anything in my life after today? And I just want to tell you the giveaway easy answer that you already know I'm going to say, yes. But if you don't already know how to say yes with me, then I want to invite you to give these next few minutes up to him. Let him talk to you. Let him show you. So I'm going to first look at did it happen? Because if it didn't happen, then we don't need to talk about the so what. If it didn't happen and you don't have a little bit of rootedness in that it did, then yeah, the rest of the conversation is just a dog and pony show minus the dog and the pony, right? Nobody's saying anything about how I look today. Okay, we're leaving that off the table. It's not fair. I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 16. And we're going to take some time to read together here the did it happen part very quickly so that you can kind of understand now that I can sense clearly, more clearly than before, that yes, this, this event did happen, if somebody who's telling me it happened is also telling me it matters right now with how I do my job, with how I talk to my kids, how I handle my money, that the resurrection by itself has an impact for now, maybe I need to listen since I know that my kids and my family and my money and my job have an effect on my daily life. And if the resurrection of Jesus has an effect on my daily life, then maybe I need to know what that effect is intended to be. Everybody with me? Let's get to work. Mark chapter 16. I'm going to read quickly verses 1 through 7. We're going to unpack quickly, did it happen? And then we'll talk about so what? Why does it matter? Mark chapter 16 in verse 1. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on, the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There 
you will see him just as he told you. Now Mark, Mark wrote this account. He was a disciple of Peter's. He wrote this account by mentioning the names in order to provide a sort of work cited. How many of you guys have written a college paper or a paper in the past where you've had to like cite your sources? You know, the work cited page on the back. I never did that. I was happy with a C. If that work cited got me an A, I'm taking the C and leaving that thing out. I don't even care, right? And so I, I, I want you to know that page is painful. The only reason you really put that on there, though, is to verify your sources, right? It's to verify that you have, in fact, done your homework. And Mark's doing a similar thing here, church. He's not just writing in the names of people just because, oh, it'd be fun to mention who, who was there, you know, for the random people throughout the centuries that are going to read this, da-da-da-da-da. That's not why he did it. As a matter of fact, he's doing this as a footnote, as a, as a works cited page to say something very clearly to the reader. As a matter of fact, these names are mentioned in all of the gospel accounts in various ways for a reason. These letter writers were not just writing some cleverly put together statements. They were trying to help people recognize, hey, if you've got any questions about that, go talk to them yourself. Because many of these people were still alive. Did the resurrection of Jesus happen? Let's look a little closely. It's an incredible claim, right? People in those times, however, were not looking for a resurrection. That's clear. They, did, they went to the tomb and they were alarmed. Even they. And he tells them, he goes, he told you. In Luke's account of this, he's like, remember when he told you he was going to be raised in three days? In Mark 8, in Mark 9, in Mark 10, all three chapters, it mentions Jesus saying to his disciples and the larger gatherings, my body will be raised on the third day. So here we are on the third day following the, resurre- or following the crucifixion, and all of these people had no idea. They'd forgotten. They didn't believe it. And I want you to know that, that as skeptical as you are today, they were too. As questioning of whether or not this event was real or not, yeah, them too. Just read the story. It's in here. They weren't expecting it, even though he told them ahead of time to expect it. Any of you have that problem in your life? Wives, don't raise your husband's hand. That was temptation, and you need to resist that. But it's the truth. We can be told, and my, yeah, my wife's working in the kids' area today, so that's probably to my benefit, so I can talk about this. But yeah, there's a constant awareness in our home of, I wasn't listening. I just, I just wasn't listening. You know, that, that me-go thing, I was in on that. And all of us have this same first century tendency to not really believe this is coming. Now, I want to give you two, two realities here that are very important. Um, if, if you were going to try to start a religion or a movement, Here's something you would not do in the first century. You would not, nobody get mad at me, if, I, if, if stuff starts getting thrown at the stage, I, this, I, this is, I didn't make this up, this isn't me, so you can't be mad at me. But you would never, not sometimes, you would never, ever use women as your eyewitnesses. Men, shush, this is not the time. Do not read too far into this, gentlemen. I am not giving you ammo. You have no chance here. Women would not have been used. As a matter of fact, I want to read you something. Women, slaves, and children of any age, in in many cases, even non-citizens, were never allowed to be legal witnesses to anything. Their names were mud. I want to read you. Celsus was a Greek philosopher. Celsus hated Christianity, not unlike many, many other people in the first century. Hated Christianity, not a fan at all. And one of the ways he helped try to convince people that Christianity was not real. Listen to this. He said... Christianity can't be true. And the reason it can't be true is because the written accounts of the resurrection are based on the testimony of women. And we all know that women are hysterical. His words, not mine. His words, not mine. But this is the point. If you wanted to start a religion that's not real, if you wanted to talk about an event that didn't actually happen, would you purposefully go out of your way to find and use the names of people who would not be trusted whose names could not be trusted to tell the truth because they're publicly considered unable to be trusted to tell the truth. Would you purposefully go out of your way to use the names that wouldn't get it across? No. Unless, of course, those are the names and it is the truth and whether or not people believe it is not up to you, but you are simply reporting what happened. Does everybody see that? Our arguments about whether or not the resurrection really happened probably aren't biblical arguments, even historical arguments, because if you look at the history, folks, You would have never picked women 
and you would have never picked uneducated people to be the disciples. You wouldn't have gone that way. Not if you want to rise to power. Not if you want to start a movement. Women were always among the marginalized. It was never a good idea to use them. So if these biblical writers are trying to do this, if they're really trying to convince the aristocracy and the leaders and also the day laborer to follow this movement, they would have never built their story and centerpiece of the resurrection on the testimony of these women, any women, unless it was the truth. And they weren't trying to convince anyone as much as they were trying to inform everyone that something had happened. And if they would let it have its effect, it would affect them greatly. In 1 Corinthians chapter, I'm sorry, I skipped this one. I'm going to read this one out loud. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 8. The Apostle Paul is talking to some of his, his leaders in the church in Corinth. And he tells them, I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received. And he tells them that Jesus Christ died, died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Now up to that part, you'd be like, okay, that's the Bible telling the Bible stuff. But I want you to listen to Paul talking to non-Jewish believers, non-Jews in other cities. I want you to listen to Paul talk to them. Because he doesn't go, you just got to believe this. Didn't you feel how great the Sunday service was? Didn't you love that song? Didn't you feel how good the, the movement was? He doesn't do that to convince them to give their lives to Jesus, to redirect their focus. What does he do? He tells them facts. He says that Jesus was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures and that He appeared. He appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. Then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom, by the way, are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, He appeared to me. Paul is trying to convince people, listen, there are people that are still alive, names of whom some of you know, and if you want to question the empty tomb and whether or not the resurrection, whether or not this Jesus really did rise from the grave and is still alive, then, and if you don't want to trust me, go talk to them. Because I delivered to you what was of first importance, that the Scriptures have been talking about that for centuries, and now here we are today. What are you going to do with it? Paul's saying, look, it's not my problem that you don't want it to have happened because you want to go on with your life. I'm just telling you it happened. And if you see that it happened, it will redirect everything about your life. Everything. So Paul's point is that there's just too many people here for this to be made up. There's just too many. 500 people at one time, some of whom are still alive. Not to mention all these famous people like Peter and the apostles and James and Paul himself. He's like, look, we, we've all encountered this risen Jesus. I got that it's weird, but we need to kind of get past that at some point. Because he is God. This isn't just some historical event and now the show's over. The show is still going. If anything, the show is building because now God is building His kingdom here on earth and He is raising people and he healing people and taking societies and reforming them and taking multi-ethnic and intergenerational groups of people and putting them in a room together, in a community together and teaching them how to fall in love with surrendering their lives and submitting to one another. Jesus is the risen King of the universe, not just some passive old guy that taught some good stuff. They all mention the names of people that their audiences would have known and that they were all mostly still alive as if to say, go check this out for yourself. It's as if they were trying to say to their skeptics, look, you can go and get these same details from these other people that we all know. I'm telling you, the reason that I am loving my enemies, the reason I'm forgiving people who have sinned against me, the reason I'm confessing my own sins. The reason I'm generous, more so than ever before and hopefully more to come. The reason I am totally content to follow Jesus as my Lord instead of the ways of this world is because He's risen. Because He lives. It's as if they're saying, I don't follow some dead guy's teaching. I'm following the living God and the author of new creation. I follow this living God because he is, in fact, risen from the grave. Paul is saying, look, this happened. It's here. 
this event did happen. And if any of you want to study this further, I would encourage you to dig in and go after it. You will find that throughout human history, society was incredibly depraved, wicked beyond measure, horrific in all of its endeavors. Governments were horrible. And then comes this Jesus of Nazareth, teaching for a few years and then dying a gruesome death. But then there's this story of him being raised again. And all of a sudden, from that point forward, a few days later is this Pentecost and this Holy Spirit is unleashed on these people as he promised, like he promised he would be raised from the dead. Folks, I understand these claims are hard to understand and hard to believe. We don't see this in our everyday. But that doesn't change that it happened. And all of these writers are trying to convince people to see because it happened, you need to do something with it. Pontius Pilate did something very important. He checked the body. Had one of his Roman soldiers who was trained to do this check the body to make sure it's dead before he gave it to Joseph of Arimathea. We have history that says Jesus was dead. We now have history that says Jesus was alive after he was dead. So what? Is the goal that we would have some weekly gathering and and sing some songs and feel really good about what's happened and then try to just barely survive our week, thinking of him almost never again, perhaps? He didn't die for this. He died for your Monday through Sunday and everything else to come. He died for the great glory of the Father that will be evident to all of us. At the end of our lives, we will stand before him and we will know then that every good thing that we were allowed to do and see is to his glory and every wicked thing is either forgiven by the Son or remembered for our judgment. This is what awaits. But he rose from the grave. So why is this important? Any of you watch Duck Dynasty? Any Duck Dynasty fans in the room? Some of you? None of whom have beards. Why? You guys aren't real fans. Michael George is a fan. That brother has a beard. If we had more time, I'd have you stand. That was legit. There's a Duck Dynasty show. It's a a family that uh, tries to follow Jesus. Uh, Some might say they're a little redneckish. Some might say they are totally depraved redneckish. I'm somewhere in the middle. They've got some weird stuff, right? But, But... uh, the father of the show, his name's Phil Robertson, at age 28, so he's, he's in his 70s now, but at age 28, he was at a bar, his sister kind of was working at the bar, and some evangelists came in and shared the gospel, and something happened. Uh, Phil didn't care at all that day. He dismissed the guy, got him out of the bar because he was messing up the business plan for the day. But, but Phil's life continued to do its steady trajectory into the gutter of all eternity. He was just train wrecking everything, and he woke up one day realizing... He needed to go talk to that evangelist guy and just hear that again. So he did. He went and talked to him. And, and what he learned was that God did, in fact, send his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to live the perfect sinless life and then, yes, absolutely pay the ransom for our sins. So here's Phil Robertson at age 28, alcoholic, into drugs, sex, drugs, rock and roll. That's his story. And he totally surrenders to give his life to Jesus in order to receive this forgiveness from Almighty God for his sins, which he happily says are many. His sins were many. And so he didn't count this as some small measure in the cosmos. But Phil Robertson had another question. He goes, that's great that I'm forgiven by a holy God, but is there anything anybody can do about this hole in the ground that I'm headed toward? The evangelist reminded him that the cross is not the only part of the gospel we celebrate. The cross by itself doesn't lay the gospel out. It is the life up to the cross. It is the life after the cross. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that is to be held and be held as a real holy power in our lives. So I want to finish our time together with this. Not only did his life and death, his blood given for our sins, which for all of us are many. Not only did he do this, not only does he offer me to be guilty no more, and I do wish to hear that, but he's done something else. He has taken care of the still sure fact that my body is going to die. In, in this wonderful historical narrative, Jesus is talking to two friends 
after a conversation about raising a friend named Lazarus from the grave, Jesus says to his friends, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall what? Never die. See, it's great to be forgiven, and that is huge, absolutely. But what good is that forgiveness if you can't help do something about the rest of the narrative we're still facing? And the rest of the narrative that we're still facing is also the reality that the grave is real. And what Jesus is like, no, 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 you're missing this. The grave is no longer a problem either. Your sins are forgiven, though many, yes, by the blood on the cross, absolutely. If you repent and believe in the good news of Jesus Christ, your sins will be forgiven. But not only that, there's more to the story. And that more to the story is to carry you and I through every single thing to become the real community of Jesus followers we're supposed to be. We're not supposed to be bored with sermons on Sunday mornings and hopefully avoiding me go. We're supposed to be alive with total abandonment, reckless at times, in how we love and administer grace in people in our lives. How fast we give, how fast we care, how fast we surrender to the good of the world around us. Why? Because our resurrected lives are already held firmly in his hands. I don't need anything from here. And neither do you. So stop holding on to the things that are here as if you need them. You do not need them. They are for you to use, money, access to people through relationships, your career, your family, things for you to engage, but you cannot get yourself to where God is taking you by holding on to those things. There's more. And I want church, I want the life of the body of Christ to be as he intended it to be, which is a group of people who see how much they need to learn to die to themselves, only insofar as they see the power of his life grow in them. A life of kindness. As I said earlier, gentle and lowly. This is our king. So what? What if you believe in the resurrection? So what? What if you believe that Jesus died and rose on the third day? What does that mean? I want to read a book, an excerpt from a book called Jesus the King. pastor who wrote this book, he wrote, you believe that Jesus has died to save you, to redirect your eternal trajectory toward God, and you believe that God has accepted you for Jesus' sake through an act of supreme grace. You are part of the kingdom of God. What then? Anybody ever have the now what reality show up in their week? Does the resurrection mean anything for your life now? Isaiah once wrote that the wolf will one day lie down with the lamb, that there would be absolute wholeness and well-being physically, spiritually, socially, and economically. When John the Baptist sends a messenger from prison to Jesus to find out, hey Jesus, are you in fact the awaiting Messiah? Are you the one we've been waiting for? Are you in fact God's anointed one? And Jesus sends word back to him, the blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cured and the deaf hear and the dead are raised and the good news is preached to the poor. Matthew 11 records for us that this is the kingdom of God. Shalom. God's peace is not waiting for us away. It is here now. Your marriages, your friendships, your job, it is here now. You don't have to wait for the pie in the sky future to one day have something to hope for. It is here now. And the resurrection brings that home. We will be reconciled totally and completely to God, to nature, to one another, and even to ourselves. And to the extent that that future is real to you, everybody lean in, to the extent that that future is real to you, it will change everything about how you live now. Why is it so hard to face suffering? Why is it so hard to face disability and disease? Why is it so hard to do the right thing if you know it's going to cost you money, reputation, even your life? Why is it so hard to do those things? Why is it so hard to face your own death or the death of loved ones? I want to tell you why. It's so hard because we think this broken world is the only world we're ever going to have.
It's easy to feel as if money is the only wealth we'll ever have, as if this body is the only body we'll ever have. But if Jesus is risen, then your future is so much more beautiful and so much more certain. Has anybody ever heard of Johnny Erickson Tata? Johnny Erickson Tata. She was uh, age 17, 18. She jumped off a diving board and was paralyzed from the neck down, a quadriplegic for life. She's in her 70s now. She literally just celebrated the 50th anniversary of her paralyzing moment. And I want to read to you a couple of things about her. She started to attend church services in order to start a, sort of deal with her paralysis and her pain. And there, there was a problem, though, of being in a wheelchair, she found, is that at a certain point in her church's liturgy, every single week, they would ask the church congregation to get on their knees in prayer. And she there was forced to recognize she's stuck in a wheelchair. She can't get out of it. She can't get down on her knees to pray with the rest of these believers. She's not able to be in the same posture that they are. She's stuck in a wheelchair. And once she said she was at a convention in which the speaker urged people to get down on their knees to pray, and she said everyone did except her. And she said, with everyone kneeling, I certainly stood out, and I could not stop the tears. But it wasn't because of self-pity. See, she was crying because the sight of hundreds of people on their knees before God was so beautiful. And then she continued weeping to another thought. She said, sitting there, I was reminded. Everybody, try to hear these words, if nothing else. Sitting there, I was reminded that in heaven, I will be free to jump up, dance, kick, and do aerobics. And sometime before the guests are called to the banquet table of the wedding feast of the Lamb, the first thing I plan to do on resurrected legs is to drop on glorified, grateful knees and I will quietly kneel at the feet of Jesus Christ, my Lord. He is risen. Ordinary life is what is going to be redeemed. I want you to remember your future, church, and I want to invite you to read with me out of the book of Revelation to finish our time together. Revelation chapter 21 the resurrection of Jesus Christ points to a better day. The power is here now. Blake, if you and the team want to go ahead and come up. Revelation chapter 21, we'll read verses 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. Celebrate. We celebrate the resurrection. Because it did happen. And because it did happen, it has the power to determine everything we need for this life. Jesus has promised everything we need. And he has made a way possible with the resurrection, the empty tomb that we celebrate today. Johnny Erickson Tata has an outward visible disability. Some of you do, some of you do not. But we all have an inward disability. Jesus has come to us. Brennan Manning, a Franciscan monk years ago, struggled mightily in sin, wrestled back and forth with many things. He once said, I believe at the end of our lives, we will all stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And in that moment, I'm convinced he will ask us but one thing. In your life, did you believe that I loved you? He came out of the grave to prove his love was sincere and his love has work to do. Broken vessels we are. Broken systems we build. These all pass away. From the resurrection we have renewed, redeemed, restored, resurrected lives. Now and forever. Amen. So church at Maine, believe in him. Believe in what he has done and have what he has given for you. Believe in him. Believe what he's done and have what he has given for you. And live. Live.